people who have already logged on. For people who have already logged on, just a reminder that um, there is no audio and there's no video, which is kind of a shame, actually. But um, that's kind of the way it is, uh, how it's been set up. Um, and we will get there. However, there is plenty of opportunity for questions. So we will give you a, an opportunity to, to, um, to do that. And I'll explain that in uh, just a few more minutes. It's just 12 o'clock now, so we shall wait a few more minutes. You're, you're absolutely correct about the, how dynamic this situation is. Uh, I'm trying to prepare something for the Colby Sawyer adult ed program uh, called Adventures in Learning. And um, constantly revising the- And even talking to 10 people's fun. <laughs> I'm glad you feel that way. Um, okay. So oh, we are now recording again. So I'm going to open the seminar. Welcome those of you who are here um, to what I said was our ninth in the um, COVID-19 seminar series sponsored by Eastman Cares, um, our education um, committee, who I always want to give a shout out to, and that's Sally Wood and Ken Dolcart, um, and Elise Kendall and Paul and myself, and I don't think I forgot anybody. Um, and as you know already, um, there is no uh, audio or video for participants in this type of a webinar format. Um, which is really kind of too bad, especially with a small group like this, but that's the way it was set up. So that's the way it is. However, that being said, um, you will and do have opportunities for questions and answers um, throughout this presentation. Um, and we would encourage though, because we have Paul monitoring these, that you do it through the Q&A and you'll see a Q&A either at the bottom or the top of your screen, depending on your device. And if you put in your question into the Q&A at any point um, during this, uh, Paul will monitor those questions and then give them um, to Dr. Fire. Uh, hopefully I said that right. You did. Thank you. Okay. Um, and so please feel free to um, ask questions um, and you can wait till the end, uh, or whatever, but we will be monitoring those so that, um, I ask you not to use the chat or the thumbs up or the all the other mechanisms that the Zoom has. Uh, just monitoring one is a whole lot easier. Um, let's see. And I always, for those of you who have been on these, always have to give a shout out to our Eastman Cares Community Resource Guide, um, which has been updated and is available at South Cove and um, online, which has got really good information. And also the Eastman Cares Connection, which is relatively new for anyone who um, would like to have a daily, weekly, monthly check-in sort of phone call. Um, we do have volunteers set up who are willing to do that. And so if you know anyone or um, if there's anyone on who would like to take advantage of what we're um, offering here, please just email us at eastmancares at eastmannh.org. Um, and I'll repeat that later. And um, someone will get back to you. Um, Let's see, this is being recorded and it will be on the YouTube Eastman link um, and it will be available through that mechanism or through um, us at that same email address um, if you would like to look at it again. And um, oh, let me talk a minute about our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Nancy Gagliano. She's going to give us an update on home and office testing for COVID-19. Um, she's very involved at this through NIH. Uh, she's an Eastmanite, and um, we're going to welcome her uh, for our next talk, which is going to be on April 2nd at the same time. And with all that being said, finally, I get to introduce our speaker. I am, and our speaker is uh, Dr. James Fryer. He is a professor of economics at Dartmouth College. He got his PhD from Brown and a BS from Stanford. His work is primarily in applied macroeconomics and his work on the impacts of demographics and trade on growth have been influential in policy circles. In particular, his work on the impact of globalization on output has informed the Brexit debate. He's published articles in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, the American Economic Review, the Review of Economics and Statistics, the Journal of European Economic Association, et cetera, et cetera. 
It is our pleasure um, to welcome Dr. Uh, Fire. Well, thank you for that nice introduction. Uh, I am going to share my screen. Um, so I hope you can all see that. That look good? Give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. Excellent. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is the impact of COVID on the economy and a little bit about how um, we've responded to that and how the government has responded to that. And so, um, and that gets us into really current events uh, because we will be talking about uh, the bill that's being debated in the Senate right now. Um, so as of the last time I checked, they were reading every word in the bill before voting on it. So it may even have passed by now. I haven't had checked the time to check this morning. Um, but first I just wanna talk about the shock that was COVID to the economy. And, and one of the main things I wanna mention is that the shock from COVID was very strange. Usually you have supply side shocks and demand side shocks and supply side things are when, you know, businesses shut down because they can't get their inputs or because you have a, you've got a bad crop season or something like that. Something disrupts your ability to make things. And COVID definitely did that. I mean, lots of disruption to um, the supply side because businesses couldn't get the inputs uh, that they needed. And this was mostly labor, but it was all sorts of other things. I mean, right now the car manufacturing business is being screwed up by the fact that there is a shortage of chips going on worldwide. And so this is still reverberating in some weird ways. Um, and, you know, we all saw the supply chain being interrupted in our own daily lives with all of the uh, panic around finding toilet paper. Um, why was toilet paper so, so in short supply? Well, you might think, well, people are still using as much toilet paper as they were pre-COVID. And the answer was that we were using toilet paper at work and less at home. And when COVID hits, we're all home all the time. And you would think that, oh, well, they could just sell that work toilet paper in the supermarkets for people to use at home. And it turns out those supply chains are completely separate, separate packaging, separate factories. And it was not at all trivial for the companies to sort of repurpose the factories they had for producing industrial toilet paper for workplaces and move that into the home setting. And so the result is you have these shortages that happen at the local level or at the supermarket level for reasons that seem kind of crazy and it wasn't hoarding. And so those are the sorts of things that cause problems. Now that's the supply side where businesses have to shut down. The demand side is customers stop showing up for certain types of businesses, movie theaters, restaurants, travel businesses, people are just not gonna do those regardless of, um, regardless of, of whether uh, the government shuts them down or not. And so even when those businesses are open, people are doing less of them. And usually recessions are either one of these types of shocks or, or another type. And this is, it's very strange to have both of these shocks operating at the same time. Now, what can policy hope to do against that backdrop? And, and the answer is it can't get everything back to normal because we know that restaurants are gonna come back eventually, but they're not gonna come back until COVID's gone. And so we're in this weird limbo, unlike say the great recession when economic activity slowed across the board and we're just trying to prop up all economic activity. We can't do that under these circumstances. And I'll show you some data that some segments of the economy are doing just fine and other segments not so well. Um, what policy might be able to accomplish in this backdrop is we can keep individuals from suffering too badly. So we can provide safety nets at the individual level. We can help the demand side be better. Um, and I'll say what I mean by that in a second, but basically we can make sure that people are continually able to buy things. And you can make it easier for the economy to recover post COVID. And so set up the, 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 pre, the, set things up so that when COVID is gone, we actually are in a position to come roaring back and those businesses are able to um, come back to life and, and do well in the, in the immediate aftermath of COVID, which, you know, fingers crossed, maybe we'll see this summer. Oh, well, that's strange. Let me show this a different way. I was sharing the screen with my students just earlier this morning. All right, can you see that now? You can see the picture? Okay. That is very strange. It's not showing my pictures. All right, so let's 
take a look at this picture. Okay, so this is showing the unemployment rate um, and it's showing the unemployment rate during the Great Recession. And can you see this? You can see this yeah. slide. Showing the unemployment rate during the Great Recession, which went up to about 10%. And then it came down, 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 down. And we finally were at an unemployment rate that was below what we had seen before the Great Recession. So we were getting down to unemployment rates that were more like 4%, which is fantastic. The economy appeared to be at pretty close to full, full steam. And then COVID hits and the unemployment rate jumps up to 15%. But that actually drifts back down pretty quickly to um, a number of 6.2 that we got just this morning. So as of this morning, the unemployment rate is um, is. 6.2%. So unemployment rate went up, spiked up, and then went down very quickly. Now, the problem is that the unemployment rate doesn't tell the whole picture. And that's because the unemployment rate only includes people who are in the labor force. It doesn't include people who've dropped out of the labor force. The way we calculate the unemployment rate is by asking people, did you look for a job? And if the answer is yes, we follow up with the question saying, um, if you did look for a job, then you're counted as unemployed. But if you answer that question, no, I didn't look for a job, then you're not counted as unemployed. You're just out of the labor force. And what that means is if you are at home homeschooling your kids, you're not unemployed. You're just out of the labor force. And so it makes a lot of sense to look at broader labor force measures. And one of these broader labor force measures that we use is um, just the total number of jobs. We can also look at the labor force participation rate. And what you can see is the number of jobs um, in the immediate aftermath of COVID dropped by over 20 million jobs. About 20 million people went from being going to work to not going to work. That bounced back pretty quickly, but as of, and again, these are numbers as of this morning, that number has only bounced about two thirds of the way back. And we're still at about oh, 15 million jobs less than we would be under normal circumstances. So that unemployment rate masks an awful lot of people not working who are out of the labor force, be it because they're taking care of their kids, because they've stopped looking, because maybe you're a restaurant worker and all the restaurants are shut down. And that's not great. And if we compare that to what happened during the Great Recession, you can see that the job losses um, during COVID were bigger, bigger, bigger than the Great Recession by a lot, but the bounce back has been much more rapid. The Great Recession, um, the 2000 recession really last, the, the job losses lasted a long time and hopefully we're gonna keep moving quickly. Now, the other thing you'll notice about this graph is we had sharp down, sharp up, and it's kind of been meandering along for the last couple of months. And again, this is data as of the end of February. Um, that meandering along is not going to stop until COVID's gone, right? It's, it's not realistic to think that we're going to get our people back in the labor force until we can open up a lot of businesses that had to be closed. The other thing that's concerning is a lot of those job losses are permanent. And so if we look at the last three recessions, at how large the permanent job loss is. And when I say permanent job loss, I mean, you're not just laid off. This isn't a job where um, they've closed the plant, you're going home for a couple months, but they expect the plant to reopen and they'll call you back when the plant reopens. These are permanent losses and the permanent losses are pretty substantial. 1.5% um, of the people who were employed at the beginning of COVID are uh, now permanently unemployed and that's not great. Um, we would like that number, obviously, not to, to stay that low. The other thing, and this is why um, we're not going to get back there until we can get back to our usual, is the pandemic has had really uneven effects on consumer spending. And so if you, if you split things between goods, services, and overall spending, overall spending is down about three. Well, first of all, all three of them dropped like crazy in April. So when we had the full shutdown, um, auto plants shut down, people stopped buying things because they weren't going to stores. As things recovered in May, June, July, and August, spending on goods, spending on things like automobiles and furniture and those sorts of things, that actually bounced back to greater than normal. So people are buying, people are using their Amazon and they are ordering a lot of stuff. So goods, the goods market is actually doing great. Amazon's doing fine. Um, if you're in the business of making things to sell, you're doing actually like objects to sell, you're actually doing just okay during the Great Recession. Those businesses are not, those businesses still have a lot of workers. 
The problem is that the service industry and services represent uh, the largest chunk of our economy, and that's restaurants, that's hotels, it's all travel type things. It's healthcare and healthcare actually, odd, oddly enough, healthcare has been lower during COVID because people are, um, people are putting off uh, optional things. And so we've been spending a bit less on healthcare. All of that is down by 6% and you add it all together and overall we have less total spending in the economy. Okay. Now, what did the feds do on this? So this is the fiscal response. And now I'm talking about the response that happened in the immediate aftermath. So this is all response that happened during 2020 and I'll, I'll move on to talking about the fiscal response that we're working on now. The biggest thing we did um, for individuals was we added an extra $600 per month for um, unemployment insurance. And that lasted through July 31st. And we extended that a little bit into August. And we also put on very loose criteria for unemployment. So that if you were a part-timer, if you were a freelancer, if you're self-employed, self Lots of times those people are not eligible for unemployment insurance. And so we expanded the definition of who was, who was um, eligible for unemployment insurance. The other thing we did was direct payments to households. And um, that was basically for people with incomes of less than 100,000, or if you were about 200,000 for joint filers, you were eligible. And we sent off $1,200 per adult, um, 500 per child under 17 years old, up to $3,400 for a family of four. As it turns out, those payments, that extra six hundred dollars, um, that extra six hundred dollars per, um, um, oh, my my apologies, six hundred dollars per week, not per month. So six hundred dollars per week turns out to be a substantial amount of money for a lot of people. And so what this chart shows is, depending on what state you live in, how much your wages were on unemployment versus how much your wages were um, before you got unemployed. And the blue line is for California, the green line is for Washington, and the red line is for Mississippi. And let's take the California case. If you were making $10 an hour and you went on unemployment, you'd basically get the equivalent of $5 an hour while you were unemployed. But then we started to pay this extra bonus of $600 per week. And so you were actually making over 150% of your normal wage. So for all of this zone below $20 an hour, for basically workers who are below $20 an hour, being unemployed actually paid more than being in the labor force. And for folks who are above that, um, the again, the amount that you would lose by, by earning more was relatively small. And so this was an awful lot of money being put out into the economy. And some of the concerns we had early on were that this was too generous and it was so generous that it would, it would basically enable people to leave the workforce and decide not to work on purpose because they were concerned, um, uh, because they were getting more being unemployed than they were employed. But keep in mind, this only lasted until August, but it was an awful lot of money. And if we look at the spending on unemployment, the blue area is our normal spending on unemployment and the orange area is the bonus spending we did on unemployment due to these extra $600 per week. So it's an awful lot of the money that we put out there involved these bonus payments for unemployment. Now, what did all this add up to? This added up to household incomes during COVID actually went up. So you would think you go into a recession, lots of people get unemployed and they lose wages. That's one side of things. The second side of thing was that we were giving this enhanced unemployment insurance and we were sending off those payments to households in the form of those $1,200 checks. Now, if we look at, um, if we look at April, that's where the biggest effect was. But you can see this is what the, the overall, the top of that bar is household income. And in the first month after COVID, the blue area goes down because that's wages, wage income. But that big red area is how much we're spending on things like unemployment, welfare payments, social security and transfer payments of all sorts. And that jumped a ton in the first month because of these $1,200 checks, but it stayed high because we kept giving this unemployment bonus. Now, as we got to the end of the summer, that unemployment bonus went down a little bit. And you can see that starting in January of this year, when the second round of checks went out, it jumped up again. But if you look at this, the main picture, the main takeaway from this is household incomes overall 
didn't actually go down during COVID, they went up. And I'm not saying it's a, a, a bad thing, but it's not like household incomes took a big hit, which they certainly did during the Great Recession. Now, you may have noticed that we've got household incomes going up and we've got spending going down. What does that lead to? And the short answer is it leads to an awful lot of savings. So if we look at personal income for, for Americans, and this is, this is data through November of 2020, wages went down by 43 billion, but the unemployment insurance went up by 500 billion from the CARES Act. The stimulus checks represented 276 billion. Um, and then other income went up by 265 billion. And the net result was total disposable, pers pers total disposable income went up by 1.03 trillion dollars during COVID, which again is very unusual during um, a recession. And if we look at the changes in, um, in people's incomes, the green, the blue area is the direct checks to households. The green area is the unemployment insurance. And you can see that the, the amounts that were being spent out as a percentage of people's incomes were very high, 16% at the beginning. And then January with the second round of checks, it was as high as 11.6%. Now, what does that do? You're giving people a lot of extra income. They're cutting back on their spending because they're not going out to eat and they're not traveling. One of the things that happened is it landed in their checking accounts. And so if we look at how much extra income showed up in checking accounts over the course of the Great Recession, big increase for the first income quartile. So that's basically the poorest people saw their checking accounts go up by a factor of two. Their checking account balances doubled. And it went up for all the different income groups. All saw their, their, the size of their checking balances go up. Second thing is lower spending, higher income equals much higher personal savings. And so if we add up the above trend income of 0.6, and this is through January, and we combine that with spending being about, about a trillion below, uh, below expected, that ends up with an extra amount of savings of $1.6 trillion, which is a lot of money in a $20 trillion economy. Okay. Um, so the aggregate savings rate went up. Normally, Americans save something like seven or eight percent of their income. During the, at the beginning of this, Americans were saving something like thirty percent of their income. So huge, huge changes in how much savings was happening. Now, one thing to pay some attention to is how this is different across the um, different across different income groups, and. If we look at this, this says this was a study that looked at how much those economic impact payments changed household behavior. The blue area is people spending more on basically normal goods, food, household goods. The lighter, the darker blue is the durable goods, then medical care, then other spending. So the whole blue area is basically spending on stuff. The yellow area is debt payments and the red area is savings. Now, one thing I would like to mention is that you should really think about debt payments as being just like savings. If you pay down your credit card versus have more money in your savings account, in both cases, you know, reducing debt and increasing savings, economists generally think about those as being roughly the same thing. And you can see for the richest households, two thirds of it went towards paying down debt or increasing their savings. And for the very, very poorest households, there's still almost 50% of the money was going into the savings. Now, what that means going forward is that households have got a lot more money and a lot bigger, less lower balances on their check on their credit card accounts, which means that when we come out of the recession, there's going to be a lot of pent up spending that happens. So once we reopen restaurants, people are going to have more money to spend on restaurants than they would in past times because of all the extra savings that's been going on over the last year. Okay. So any questions? I, I, I'm, it's, it's always a little tricky uh, lecturing to a, a blank screen. I can't tell how I'm doing. Um, nope. No, no um, questions yet. Okay, that's great. Um, the second thing we want to know, so that's what Congress did. And the second question you might want to ask is, what did the Federal Reserve do, the monetary policy response? 
And a lot of what the Fed did was simply a continuation of the things that they've been doing since the financial crisis. And so they kept interest rates low. They, they kept quantitative easing, which meant they're, they're buying up bonds. I won't get into the details of that. They did lending of banks, um, loosened regulatory requirements, a lot of things that the, that the Fed has basically been doing over the last decade since the um, Great Recession. They did add a number of new measures. One of the things they started to do is they started to buy up commercial bonds. So they started to buy up commercial debt. And so by that, they're driving down interest rates. Um, they also, um, in addition to um, something I haven't mentioned, which is the PPP loans that Congress extended to small businesses, the Fed did some other lending to businesses that were um, a bit too large for the PPP loans. They did a number of other things. They also started buying up municipal bonds to prop up state and local governments. So the Fed did a number of things. Okay. Yes, sir, we, we do yes. have a question. Sure. Uh, with the extra savings, why can't people pay rent? Well, remember that on, this is on average people have extra savings. It doesn't mean everybody has extra savings. And I'll actually give an example of that. We had this expanded unemployment definition. And to get that though, you had to be, you had to apply, you had to get it. And so um, I use, I, I have a barber and, I, and my barber shut down for two months. And in addition to shutting down for several months, um, they're working less days and less hours because a lot of people aren't getting their hair cut. And my barber lives in Vermont, works in New Hampshire. She applied for unemployment insurance in Vermont. And it took a while for them to figure out that it's like, oh, you work in New Hampshire, so you're not eligible for Vermont unemployment. You need to apply in New Hampshire. The net result was she never figured it out, never got that extra $600 a week she almost certainly would have been one of those people whose income would have gone up unemployed relative to working. And so she didn't get the money. And this is actually one of the arguments. Uh, there's a lot to be said for having um, the relief package that we're working on now be very heavily aimed at unemployed people because they need the money more than most people do. The problem with that is there are always going to be people who fall through the cracks of that system. And that's the argument in favor of sending checks to everybody. The problem with sending checks to everybody is that a lot of people who get the checks are actually, they don't need them or they're, you know, if you sent me a check, I really wouldn't be all that useful to me. It would just go straight into my savings account. And so that's really tricky, uh, the balance between the sending money to everybody so that nobody gets missed versus targeting the money, but targeting always has the problem of you, your aim is not always perfect. Okay, does that make sense? We have, um, a, we have one other question. And sure. Why has the stock market hit record highs in the middle <laughs> of this pandemic? So it's a bit of a running joke that as an economist, the first question people always want to ask you when you're an economist is what about the stock market? Um, so one thing I would say is, uh, I think the short answer is we don't know. I, I think it's it's hard to it's it, I think they, I think part of it is we don't know. Part of it is that the firms that make up a lot of the big stock indexes have actually not suffered very much during COVID. And so, you know, if you're Google, if you're Apple, well, demand for your product has actually been great. Netflix, demand for your product has been great. The kinds of businesses that have been hit the hardest are actually the sorts of businesses that don't trade on the stock market. So, you know, um, Salt, Salt Hill Pub going out of business, or not out of business, but Salt Hill Pub shutting down in Hanover and Skinny Pancake moving out of Hanover and uh, other businesses in Hanover um, shutting down over COVID. COVID, none of them are going to be the kinds of businesses that trade on the stock market. And so I think a lot of the sorts of businesses that get their funding through the stock market are actually the exact kind of businesses that um, operate well in a global economy where people are working remotely. But beyond that, I, I don't want to say too much about the stock market because um, as an economist, I really ultimately don't know that much about the stock market. Um, there are economists who do know more than me. Um, to get back to the question that we had before though, looking at these disparate impacts is really important because you know the picture I painted so far is, you know, COVID hit and we've spent a lot of money and actually it turns out that households have more income than they did before COVID. And that's some households and it's on average households, but it's not all households. 
And so if we look at the change in employment by education level, folks like me with advanced degrees, we've barely felt it, right? There, there's been very little movement in employment. So we're down a little bit at the beginning, but people with a bachelor's degree, for the most part, their, their, their employment is down a couple percentage points. I mean, it's not nothing, but it's not a lot. If we look at people who had some college, a high school degree or no high school degree, they got slammed harder in the beginning. And while there's been a fair degree of recovery, that group, anybody who's in that less, less than a full bachelor's degree group is much less, much, they've been hurt much harder by this than the bachelor's degree group. And you can see this a bit in the, um, the degree to which people with different kinds of education are able to work remotely. Folks like me with graduate degrees, we can work remotely. 50% of us, as of February, we're working remotely. People with bachelor's degrees, 37% of people with bachelor's degrees are working only. People with only high school degrees, only 8% of them are working from home. And that's a problem, right? That, that, that is another area where you see a much more disparate impact between the groups. The other thing that we saw, at least early in the recession, was big differences between men and women. And those hit in the very beginning, more women lost their jobs than men, where women here are the mothers. And by the way, this is just um, parents living with school-age kids. So this is concentrated on the school age kids zone. But basically more women left the labor force um, at the beginning of COVID that stayed true throughout the summer, bounced up a little bit more in September. So when kids went back to school, people with kids actually started to lose some of the recovery they've had. And in the last couple of months, actually, the female male difference has closed quite a bit. And I updated these numbers. Last time I looked at these numbers were in September. And so I was actually a bit surprised to see um, that these numbers had closed up a bit. That being said, over the course of the recession, it's been worse for women than it has for men. Um, let's move on from this. Other thing to notice is that um, there's been big international differences in the impact. And so if we look at GDP growth across a bunch of the big countries of the world, the United States saw GDP in 2021 or 2020 go down by 3%, which is bad, but it's actually given everything that happened, it's much less bad than we expected, to be honest. The Eurozone, on the other hand, Europe saw 7% drops. They saw twice as big a drop in GDP as the United States did with like France and the UK seeing double digit, almost double digit uh, drops in GDP. So the US within the, the context of other countries actually has weathered, weathered this economically pretty well. The other thing to recognize is during the pandemic, every once in a while, you'll see people talk about how, oh, the United States only sent out $1,200 to everybody and they only did it once, completely ignoring those unemployment payments that I was talking about. Um, if you look at how much the U.S. has spent on support as a percentage of GDP, overall support compared to Japan, Italy, Germany, and the U.K. is a little bit lower in the U.S., but the, the thing to pay attention to is the red bar, which is the red bar is, that's like money sent to people. The gray area includes things like loans to businesses. The red area is how much money did you send to individuals? And the US, the amount the US spent um, sent to individuals per person er, as a percentage of GDP is actually relatively high among the rich nations. And so the US response to this um, so far has been quite large. And if we pass the second package, um, our direct, our direct, um, our direct payments to individuals will be higher than anybody else in the world. All right, what's next? Most economists are expecting the recovery to take a while, and um, I think most economists aren't expecting a, a full recovery before 2022. The one thing I would say about that is economists are basically terrible at predicting stuff. That we're we're really really not good at forecasting. And so one major caveat I would make to that is anybody who's making super clear predictions saying, this is what's gonna happen, I would be very suspicious of them because nobody knows. And the degree to which we're in uncharted territory with COVID, as I talked about in the beginning, is, is unbelievable. We've never seen anything like this around the globe before. What are we about to do? So this is um, a chart from the New York Times from like a week and a half ago. So I can't make promises that this is exactly right as of today because a lot's happened politically. Um, but this is basically the spending that's being debated now. And the gray area is how much money we've already spent. 
you'll notice the amount that we're talking, and the red area is what the, the Republicans were present proposing, and the blue area is what um, the Biden plan was. And what's being debated in Congress looks an awful lot like what the Biden plan uh, looks like. A couple things to notice. One is the amount of small business aid that's in this is actually quite small relative to what we've already spent. Unemployment benefits are relatively large. Healthcare is relatively large, and healthcare is basically direct spending on COVID measures. The stimulus check piece of this, which is probably the most talked about piece, is actually quite large and bigger than the first stimulus check piece. This is this argument about a $2,000 check and a $1,400 check, some of which went out, 600 of which went out in January. Um, aid to individuals is more money for individual um, spending and then other spending. The one I want to pay a little attention to is the state and local government, which is actually the biggest bar there. Now, the reason that we go, the state and local government is thought to be important is because state and local governments um, typically during recessions have a lot of trouble financing their operations. They tend, to, they tend to lay people off because they lose a lot of tax revenue. Um, and that was especially true during the Great Recession. During the Great Recession, many states had a lot of trouble paying their bills and states were basically laying off people and the feds um, came in and gave them some support to try to keep them from doing that. And that's, that's basically what this provision of the bill is for. I'm a little worried about that provision because I think it's possible that we're fighting the last war here. And what do I mean by that? So this picture tells me how much each state has lost in revenue through in 2020 compared to how much they had in 2019. The red, the states that are pictured in red um, had declining revenue between the two years and the states that are in blue had increasing revenue across the two years. And a couple of things to notice here. One is it's kind of shocking how many states actually are collected more revenue in 2020 than 2019 despite COVID. So we look at California. California has actually more money on hand than they did in 2019. So COVID has not devastated state finances in any of these states that you see in blue. Second thing is a couple of the states in red need to have some caveats. So in particular, North Dakota at minus 14.8 and Texas at minus 10.4, and in particular, Alaska at minus 42.5, those drops in state revenue are almost certainly due to drops in oil prices. This is not, this is more normal for them in some sense, right? That, that those states are used to huge swings in state revenue when oil prices go up and when they go down, and we're kind of expecting oil prices to head back up over this summer. So those are states that, yes, they've had big drops in revenue, but these are drops in revenue of the sort that they're kind of used to. Um, the other states with big drops in revenue are, um, are Hawaii and Florida, which tourism. So those are states that actually probably do have some fiscal crises going on. And um, the other state to pay a little attention to is Oregon. And it turns out that that minus 10.5 in Oregon is a bit of an accounting thing. So don't pay too much attention to that, apparently. The people who know more about this than I do tell me that that has to do with something about how they managed money in 2019. So when you start to stare at this, you see there's a lot of states that had like maybe 2% loss of revenue. And you've got some states that had like uh, New Hampshire that actually saw state revenue go up by 2.2% and Maine that went up by 2.2%. Not huge movements. And we're talking about spending, um, we're talking about spending um, over a trillion dollars to state and local governments. And so that's one of the pieces that I suspect like that I'm less in favor of. And frankly, I would much prefer that to see that money go to more unemployment benefits because the unemployment benefits piece of this is designed to expire in August. And frankly, I would rather see the unemployment benefit extensions go farther into the year than just to expire in August. And I would gladly give up the state and local government spending for that. Um, so talking about the fiscal relief, and I've already talked about some of this, one question, is it enough? And a lot of this has some flavor of fighting the last war. The amount of stimulus we did during 2009, during the Great Recession, was probably too little. And one of the reasons the Great Recession, we took so long to recover from that is because we probably should have been doing more of this kind of spending during the Great Recession. And the Biden administration is filled with people who lived through that period and felt like in retrospect, they should have spent more trying to get the economy back on track during the Great Recession. They're not gonna make that mistake again. Second thing is that one of the things we learned in the 90s is 
that um, it takes a really, really healthy labor market to help the low end of the labor market. If you want people with just a high school education to see wage growth, you need to get that unemployment rate down really, really low. It can't just be decently low. You have to have an incredibly hot labor market. And there's a lot of economists who are feeling like we need to push the labor market until those people are helped since they got hurt so much by this, since the low end got hurt by this. Now, on the flip side, you might ask, is it too much? And, and I think the two questions that you have to ask yourself for the too much piece, and I'll talk about this in a second, is, is it going to cause inflation? And are budget deficits going to be so high that that's going to lead to higher interest rates and we're going to have higher taxes in the future in order to pay that back? And so those are two questions I'll address in a second. The second question I've already talked about a bit, which is, is, the, is, the, is it well targeted to what we need? So unemployment relief, well targeted. It always goes to people who are out of work and need the money. Um, checks for everyone, yeah, a lot of the checks for everyone are gonna go to households that have not lost jobs, that are spending less and that have actually bigger bank accounts than they did before COVID started. And so you're gonna spend a lot of money that's probably not gonna be all that helpful. That being said, as I mentioned earlier, um, unemployment may miss some people who are, who are in need. Is being spent at the right time. So some of this state and local relief is going to things like upgrading the HVAC systems in schools. So do we really want to be spending money in 2023 with the goal of trying to get out of the COVID slump when we may be well past the COVID slump by then? So we might, any money we're spending in out years is probably not great. And then last, um, last two things, what about all the savings? So to some degree, a lot of the money we spent on relief already has yet to show up in the economy because we've got $1.6 trillion worth of additional savings that have not been spent yet and that will presumably be spent in the time after um, the recession ends. And then last but not least, how will the Fed respond? So just look at the budget deficit piece. This is, um, this budget deficit, the, the graph I have here is how big is the national debt as a percentage of US GDP? And you can see that World War I, we got to a little bit above 100% of GDP in our, or 100% of debt to GDP ratio. So our debt was basically about the same size as the amount of goods and services that we produced in a year. But after World War II, that number went down, 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 started to go back up again in the 80s, down a bit in the 90s and then jumped up to about 70 or 80% during the Great Recession, the pandemic is pushing that above 100% again. So we're in a position where our debt is higher than it's ever been before in our history. And given the spending priorities, and a lot of this is the baby boomers being retired and healthcare expenses for the baby boomers going up, that is projected to do nothing but go up over time. So the debt is not getting smaller. And that might be something that you worry about. Now, if you're worried about that, one of the things you might worry about is interest rates going up. And so if the government is doing all this borrowing, we worry that it's going to crowd out investment on the private sector. That being said, I, I think a lot of my audience is old enough to um, have been around in the 80s and 90s. And you might remember that if we look at interest rates, interest rates back in 1980, when I was still in high school, were as high as 15% on five, 10, and 20-year government bonds. Now, 10-year government bond um, interest rates might not be something that you follow very closely, but it turns out that the interest rate on a 10-year on a government bond is a pretty good um, predictor of what a 30-year mortgage interest rate is. And I suspect lots of you know about 30-year mortgage interest rates. I bought my first house in the 90s, and I've been doing nothing but refinancing mortgages since I bought my first house. Why? Because interest rates have been going down, 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 down. And in the wake of what's been going on during the pandemic, there's not a lot of indication that the markets are worried about interest rates going up going forward. They still are staying quite low. And these are interest rates as of like last week. So I, I updated these, these data pretty, pretty quickly. The other thing you might worry about is inflation. You might think, oh, the economy is going to, we're going to do a lot of spending. It's going to overheat the economy and that's going to lead to inflation. Um, I always like, when I talk about inflation, I always like to show this picture, which is on the x-axis is how old you are today. So for me, it's a little bit over 50. And the blue line tells me what was the average inflation that I experienced in my kind of early adult years between the ages of 20 and 40. And so I grew up during a period where when I was um, 
when I was like zero to 20, inflation was pretty high, but inflation basically came down to about 3% by the time I was 20. And so the time when I was really starting to be an economic actor, collecting checks, taking out loans, all those sorts of things have always been a relatively low inflation environment. On the other hand, if you're 70 today, you spent your formative years in the 70s when inflation was crazy high and you experienced like six or 7% inflation. It turns out that when you talk to people, it's really hard to get people below 50 concerned about inflation. And it's really easy to get people over 60 concerned about inflation. And um, I'm not saying that, they, that either side is right or is wrong, but your lived experiences does inform how much you worry about inflation. Um, the Fed is increasingly run by the younger generations. The Fed of 10 years ago was worried more about inflation than the Fed now. That being said, the Fed feels like they have a pretty good understanding of how to get rid of inflation should it show up. So one scenario we could have is we're spending a ton of money, it's gonna overheat the economy, and then the Fed's gonna raise interest rates in order, to, in order to rein that back in. And they're gonna be more aggressive about doing that than they were back in the 70s, for those of you who remember the inflation of in the 70s. Now, one measure of how concerned we should be about inflation comes from the bond market. And we saw the Fed actually sells two kinds of bonds. They sell normal Fed treasury bonds where you, know, you get 5% interest a year for 10 years. And they sell what's known as treasury inflation protected securities, also known as TIPS bonds. And the TIPS bonds pay the change in the CPI plus an interest rate. And so if you think inflation is going to be 2% a year, the TIPS bond will pay 3% plus that CPI of 2%, whereas the normal bond will just pay 5%. So one of the reasons the Fed likes to sell these bonds is if you look at the difference in interest rate between the one that sells for an interest rate that gets the CPI tacked on top of it versus the one that just gets a straight interest rate with no inflation adjustment, the difference between those two tells you what the markets think inflation is going to be over the next five-year horizon and the next 10-year horizon. And one of the things to notice is the, the gap between those two. So the blue line is the five-year and the red line is the 10-year inflation expectations is um, that's jumped a lot since the first year. And it's jumped a lot in part because since um, the election, the anticipation of a big fiscal package being passed has, has led people to think, oh, inflation is going to be higher. Now, I would caveat that a little bit that inflation expectations have simply moved from being like 1% to something like a little over 2%. That's not a terrible thing. 2% is about what we expect to see. It's kind of what the normal looks like. And so it is true that inflation expectations have jumped a little bit in anticipation of this big fiscal package being passed. Um, I'm not overly concerned about it, but this is a number that I'll be looking at. Um, and just zooming in on this, you can see that almost all of this has happened since the election. This is like entirely a post-election thing. And as it becomes clear that they're going to spend, a, the, the fiscal package is getting bigger and bigger, this, this number has grown. All right. Um, last but not least, I just want to say that a lot of what's going to go on in the macro economy over the next six months in particular is going to be driven by the virus. And so if we look at, say, numbers like travel. Travel, this is how many t people went through the TSA checkpoints where the, the light blue line is 2019, the dark blue line is 2020, and the red line is 2021. And we're, we're seeing basically about 30% of normal travel levels um, in, um, in 2020 compared to 2019, even at the end of 2019. So travel came to a halt. Eating out dropped like crazy. And one of the things to notice about this, and this is eating out based on um, reservations using an app from uh, Open Table. But one of the things to notice about this is while there are some differences regionally, um, the degree to which regional differences in policy play a role is less than you think. So, you know, up here we've got Florida and Texas, which have not been super aggressive on policy. And they've had lower drops in the number of reservations, although only recently. But it's not like Florida and Texas are at normal. And it's not like um, California and New York, which have been the most aggressive about this. It's not like they have, um, they have zero reservations going on. If we look at transit systems, same thing. We look at US, uh, at New York City, LA, Chicago, Houston, 
all of the transit system ridership is way down. Doesn't matter whether your state is more shut down, less shut down, people are staying home. Um, if we look at office occupancy, again, dropped um, to about 20% of normal through November of this year. And that's true for the Houston Metro, it's true for the Austin Metro, as well as it's true for the New York Metro. And in fact, the number of people working from home has basically stayed steady since about August. Dropped a little bit from the beginning to August, but stayed relatively steady. A lot of those things, you know, who knows how those are going to go? And is the vaccine penetration going to be good enough that people are willing to walk into restaurants again? Are people going to be willing to go back to cruise ships again? And so, you know, one of the, the interesting questions going forward, and I'll talk for about two minutes uh, more, is how much are people going to be willing to go back to doing things? And how much are people going to like some of these changes? So retail in the U.S. was on a downward slide before COVID hit. People like Amazon. Retail was already on the way down. And so how much of retail is actually going to bounce back? Um, are, people going to, are there people who are going to continue to homeschool their kids? Um, online shopping seems like it's going to be a big winner from all this. And so thinking about some of the long-run implications for travel and leisure, for retail, for work, for education, for real estate, are places like Eastman going to see a big boost in, uh, in popularity as people want to get out of Boston and want to move out into the woods where, you know, COVID is where it's prettier and you can do activities that don't um, involve lots of people packed into rooms. Um, I think those are the questions that we're, that we're going to see going forward. So I'll quit my share. And that is, that's the end of what I have formally to say. I hope I wasn't too fast. So, An excellent um, presentation. Any more, how about questions? Questions from the participants? Anyone else? Uh, none from the participants at this point, but um, if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind asking a question or two of my own. I would love yeah. that. Thank you. If, if we have the time, uh, I'm still trying to wrap my head. Earlier in the in your 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 presentation, you talked about uh, many jobs being permanently lost, mm -hmm. and people who are not looking for jobs are no longer thought of as unemployed. Correct. Um, so is that I, is that just sort of a measurement issue? Um, I mean, that's, that's always true, right? So this is the standard way that we measure unemployment is always the same way. We call people up and we ask you, did you go to work last week? If you did go to work, we'd say you're in the labor force and you are employed. Second question we ask, if, if you say, I didn't go to work last week, we ask you, well, did you look for a job last week? If your answer to that question is no, we put you down as out of the labor force. And then we follow that up with a lot of other questions like, why weren't you in the labor force? Were you a student? Were you a stay-at-home parent? Were you retired? Um, are you 15? So we, we followed that up with a bunch of other questions, but the standard headline unemployment rate that, that we listen to every month is from those first two questions. Mm -hmm. And so mostly economists, so there are times actually Actually, when the unemployment rate drops, and it's bad news. So sometimes in the beginning of recessions, what you'll see is, oh, the unemployment rate went from 6% to 5.9%, but it'll turn out that's because a whole bunch of people who were looking for work stopped looking because they were discouraged, right? And they, they, they've been looking for three months and they decide, you know, I've looked for three months, there's nowhere else for me to look. And so we have expanded definitions of unemployment that we go to and we look at. And the broadest of those is, um, is this just looking at the uh, labor force participation rate, like what percentage of adults are going to work every day. And, you know, think about something, think about like somebody who's dropped out of the labor force because they have a six-year-old whose kid is doing remote school, right? I mean, that is happening everywhere. Yeah. That person's not looking for a job. They know they can't take a job. They're homeschooling their kid and they have no prospect of not homeschooling their kid for months and months and months in a lot of places. I mean, we've been blessed in Hanover by having our schools open throughout all of this. Um, but a lot of places they've been stuck at home and I don't know what having, I can't imagine having a first grader and having them do Zoom school, right? Yeah. Effectively the parent, um, some parents might be able to manage that by working from home, but if you were a cook at a restaurant and you, um, your kid is now at home, 
um, you're going to be out of labor force. And there's not a lot that's going to fix that until we get things back to normal. But you're, but this is, a, this is a problem all the time in the sense that even during normal times, this question of who's in the labor force and who's out of the labor force is one that economists pay a lot of attention to. Okay, uh, a couple questions have come in. Uh, first, has the wealth uh, and income gap widened during COVID? And what are the prospects for this gap closing? Um, I, the, the short answer is definitely yes. Uh, I mean, some of the data that I showed you showed, um, especially across education lines, um, high-income people basically didn't see a huge COVID COVID. COVID impact. If you, I mean, I, I, it's funny because faculty are very concerned about the impacts of COVID and there's been lots of discussion among the Dartmouth faculty about COVID's impact. But if you step back a second, um, if you're, especially if you're a Hanover faculty member who lives in Hanover or Lebanon, the schools have kept working for the most part, Hanover completely. Um, your daycare has been functioning since the end of winter. Um, your job is remote, and so you're able to do what you need to do. Your paycheck never slowed down. Um, we didn't get a raise at the beginning of this year, but that's a fairly small thing, small price. Um, and so for the most part, I, I do worry about that. And that's a, that's a lot of why there are a number of economists who are really advocating for um, really putting our foot to the floor in terms of the fiscal support why they think that the, the package that Congress is debating right now can't possibly be big enough because the only way to bring the bottom of that distribution up is to get the economy roaring hot. A lukewarm economy, the, econ the, the, the top end does fine in a lukewarm economy and the bottom end of the economy doesn't do as well. A roaring hot economy does good things for the low end. And frankly, the last time we saw that was the 90s. Um, we've, the last couple of recessions have been long, they've lingered a long time. We really haven't seen tight, tight, tight labor markets that have tended to drive up wages. We really haven't seen that since the 90s. And there's a lot of economists, and the Fed, by the way, um, the Fed is, that's their thinking too. So as of this minute, the Fed very much wants the economy to get as hot as possible without inflation. And I think they're gonna let, they're, they're, they're less concerned about inflation than they have been in the past, I think because they want the economy to get boiling hot to help that bottom end. Okay, and thank you. And, and the last one, at least at this point, do you think the pent up demand from savings will generate more taxes, to help cover some of the deficit spending? Short answer, no. <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, I, the, there seems to be politically, I mean, the only way to get more taxes is if Congress is willing to pass tax, tax bills and the president's willing to sign them. And as of right now, nobody's facing any negative consequences for big budget deficits. And so the, the consequence you usually worry about for big budget deficits is interest rates rising. And interest rates are super low. And so if, if the, you know, right now, I think the data I showed, the interest rate on a 10 year treasury is like 2% right now. And if inflation's 2% and you're paying 2% interest, uh, for those of you who remember your, uh, your, your, your finance, um, the real interest rate on that, basically how much you have to pay back is effectively zero. And I, so, so I'm sympathetic to the idea that big debt right now is actually pretty low consequence. That being said, I don't know that that'll be true 10 years from now and 20 years from now. So I suppose my short answer to that is I can't imagine seeing tax increases passed to pay off the budget deficit in the next, four, under the Biden, first, first, first uh, term of the Biden administration. 10 years from now, could there be a crisis where interest rates start to go up and we feel like, holy crap, we need to deal with this? Absolutely. And that's, that's the big fear, that, that there's going to be a reckoning at some point. We just don't know what it is. Given the politics right now, it's not like either party is arguing for higher taxes right now. Um, and, and so I think the odds of there being a tax increase are pretty low. Um, at this point, except maybe to pay for a big program. But even then, I, I think the, the politics around tax increases right now is, is very, very um, non-existent. That, that's all I have to... Did you have one more, Paul? I had a question, but... Uh, Why don't you have time? Okay. Uh, so going back to the, the, uh, the chart on... Uh, 
you know, where, where money is intended uh, in the stimulus bill. Uh, and state and local uh, revenue in many places, uh, other than the, the exceptions, as you talked about with the oil and gas industry being huge or where it's huge, uh, they were fairly, fairly small percentages to do something, whatever. And I guess I'm a retired public health person. <laughs> you know, I'm looking and seeing that, well, public health has been uh, downsizing for years. Uh, so is the, the one year 2% really reflective of the, the actual need? Uh, a lot of gaps sure. need to be. Yeah, no, I, I'm sympathetic to that. And I think some of the health spending may represent that. So the idea that we would... Um, upon reflection say, hey, we're gonna actually, the feds are gonna pass a bunch of money to beef up state level public health infrastructure. I think that's actually a really good idea and we should be doing that. But I think there's a separation of, we need to pass something right this minute in order to help with the economic recovery from COVID. And some of that money, if I, if I look at my chart again, I think some of that money was directly to health. So there was a fairly, fairly big chunk. So a chunk that was about, that was about half as big as the state and local government chunk, about half that is for healthcare. And I don't know if some of that was directed at the state health agencies, but one could imagine doing that. Um, so I'm sympathetic to that, but I think a lot of the state and local government money is literally just, you know, handing money to the state and local schools and to the state and local governments with at least the argument being that it's supposed to fill fiscal gaps that just don't exist. Mm -hmm. But I agree with you that I think in the long run, stepping back and asking what can we do about public, like what things need more money in the aftermath of COVID and what things need less money in the aftermath of COVID. I, we should definitely have that reckoning, but I, it's not clear that it has to happen in the context of this bill. Like that could happen. We could talk about that in August, I suspect. Um, you know, when we step back and say, okay, what lessons were learned from this? Uh, what did we do well? What did we do badly? What could we do more of? What could we do less of? Um, I don't think we're in a particularly good position to evaluate that right now. I think it's a little early. Well, uh, Sue, is it time for one more? Yeah, time for one more. Okay. All right. Oh, nice. What do we tell our grandchildren graduating from college this year about the overall economics of jobs being available to them? It's funny you ask that because I have a senior in college right now. <laughs> um, I think it's massively dependent on what sort of things your grandchildren are interested in going into. Um, and, uh, you know, th so, so the one piece of bad news is it's well known that graduating during a recession is just bad, <laughs> like tends to depress lifetime income. Like I, and I graduated in the middle of a recession, so I'm aware of this. So the cohorts that graduate during recessions typically, and, and when we say it's bad, it's like, it's not like it's, they're going to be in poverty their whole lives. It's just their income will be a bit, you know, a couple percentage points lower over their lifetime than somebody who graduates during a boom. Um, I think it depends a lot on industries. I think, you know, tech, I think tech is hiring just as much as they ever have. Um, I think uh, healthcare, bio, biotech, they're hiring like crazy too. Um, if on the other hand, uh, you know, you've got a grandkid who's interested in working in service industries, that's a lot harder, right? Like if you, if they, if they're like, a, uh, you know, going to the hotel school at Cornell, that would not necessarily be a great time to be graduating. Although, um, I'm kind of amazed at how much preparation for the recovery is happening right now. And, and, and I'll sort of leave on that, that the, if you look at downtown Hanover, which is one market I know, we had um, like three or four restaurants, some of which were on their way out before COVID, but basically we've got a bunch of empty restaurant spaces. And the folks who own Molly's, the folks who own Murphy's are already have plans to reopen those. And they're talking about reopening them in May with new restaurants. And to me, it's very hopeful that they're thinking ahead, thinking that, oh, by the time May rolls around, the vaccinations will be hitting hard. By the time June rolls around, maybe we can be at normal levels. People are going to have pent up spending. And so I could imagine a scenario where there are three or four brand new restaurants in downtown Hanover that by August are actually going huge 
doing huge business. And that would be the sort of thing that would lead us to have a pretty rapid recovery. That hotels would fill up, people would be like, you know, I, I could imagine a scenario where it's really hard to get a vacation spot this summer. Uh, my parents live in the Outer Banks, and the Outer Banks was crazy last summer in terms of rentals because it was a good place to go to get away from COVID. And apparently it is rented out for the whole summer. My dad, my dad plays golf with the people who run the real estate agencies down there. And uh, it's apparently already booked to the nines. And last summer was actually a pretty good summer for, for the Outer Banks. So I don't know. We're going to see. I think it depends a lot on industry by industry how things are going to go. Thank you. You're welcome. This Thank was fun. That was a, a wonderful talk. Um, we very much appreciate it. And uh, if there are any other questions, um, you can please, you could just email us. Um, and we're also always looking for suggestions. We have three more in this series, but then um, come next year, we're always looking for suggestions for additional topics and talks. Um, and evaluation, by all means, if you have comments about any of the presentations, really let us know. So that's Eastman Cares at EastmanNH.org. And again, we really want to thank uh, Professor Fire for his presentation. And um, I hope everyone has a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.